Thanks, bud. Thank you for being here today. So we're going to talk about our health and uh, happiness section of, of our climate adaptation plan, which starts on page 138 and runs until 176. So there's quite a few things to cover in here, and we're excited to get going uh, and chat with you about it. Apologies to people on the line who have just me very present on the camera. I apologize. Uh, and thank you for being here in person. Uh, and so this section covers both physical health, which is the one that we're going to spend uh, our first portion on, uh, but then it also goes through emotional well-being. And so we wanted to make sure that we were capturing everything that was being impacted by climate change. And our health, our mental health is one of them, as well as our physical health, which gets a lot of attention. Uh, and so I'm going to zoom out just a little bit so we can see a little bit more of this. So our first impact to physical health is going to be complications from extreme heat. And we have this table, uh, 3D.1, potential pathways of complications from heat. And so uh, we know that, I mean, we've all experienced the heat. We've had already a couple of heat events that were very unusual here in the month of May. Uh, and we know that heat is very unpleasant, but we also need to be aware that it's actually very dangerous and very deadly as well, especially if you don't have a way of getting away from it and coping with it. Uh, and so we know from downscale climate projections for our area that in Umatilla County, the frequency of days at or above 90 degrees, which is classified as extreme heat, is 90 degrees or above Fahrenheit, uh, are projected to increase by almost 30 days by mid-century. And so that's a doubling of our current days. And so right now we experience kind of Two weeks or so of days over 90 kind of across our summer season, but we expect to see a doubling of that by mid-century and actually a tripling of that by late century. Uh, and so these are very scary figures because we do spend so much time outside and then our buildings are actually geared for temperatures a lot lower than that. And so it creates a lot of stress on our human systems as well as our infrastructure. Prolonged exposure to heat can cause morbidity and mortality. So that's death and sickness. Uh, especially for those who are struggling with any kind of chronic illness and even for those who are healthy. So we know that people who have pre-existing health issues are always going to get hit worse by all of these. But heat is actually something that even if you're healthy, if you are exposed to prolonged heat for a period of time and you have like heat stroke or heat stress, that is something that stays with you. If you get heat sickness one time, you are more susceptible to heat sickness for the rest of your life. And so it is in everybody's best interest to not have heat stress because that does follow you. Uh, and it follows you because it puts a lot of strain on your body in different ways. And that's what this 3D1 is about. It's about all the different ways that the heat stresses your body. So going through this list, we see that uh, the first category, across the top, we see the different kinds of effects that heat has. And on the left-hand side going down, we see the organs that it's affecting. And so ischema is insufficient blood flow to the organs. And so that's when you are, your body is trying so hard to regulate heat to bring your body temperature down. And it's actually shunting blood away from your organs to your skin to try and perspire. Uh, and so that actually leaves your organs with insufficient blood flow. And that's what we call ischema. Heat toxicity is when the body temperature surpasses thermal cell tolerance. So literally inside of your body becomes so hot that your cells start to kind of come apart. It's a very scary idea. Uh, and so that's what we call heat, cyto, uh, yeah, heat cytotoxicity. And so that affects almost every uh, organ of the body. Um, we also have experiences where it compounds, all these different effects compound. And so hypokalemia is a potassium deficiency caused by sweating and urination. So part of what our body tries to do to regulate our heat, our heat is uh, perspiration. We sweat and it evaporates on our skin. And in theory, that's taking heat away from our bodies. But what that also is doing is taking water and salt away from our bodies at the same time. A long period of time, that can cause a lot of problems as well. And it also increases the risk of cardiac arrest because of this, because we're causing our body to work harder. We're shunting blood away from our organs. It makes our heart have to work harder. And that increases our risk of heart attack. Uh, if we are not taking insufficient water during all of this as well, we have a dehydration issue, 
which increases the risk of coronary thrombosis and stroke. So coronary thrombosis is a blood clot in your heart. Uh, and that and stroke is a blood clot in your brain. So if you are dehydrated during extreme heat events, the, the risk of uh, heat, the risk of stroke and uh, blood clotting in your heart is greater. Uh, and so we see through this um, list here that there are 20 different different ways that extreme heat can cause problems from just one person. And so if we look at this and we say, OK, everybody is going to be experiencing extreme heat to different degrees. Everybody is going to be having these different issues come up if they're not prepared. So we know that when we're getting our community ready for extreme heat, we can plan for all these different things. We're making sure people are hydrated. We're making sure people have access to shade. We're making sure that people, um, you know, are able to get out of the heat in some way. The second physical impact that we see is complications from wildfire smoke. I apologize for kind of the density of the information here in figure 3D.2, but uh, you know it takes just a little bit of sitting there looking at it, and we'll kind of talk through it really quickly anyway. Um, wildfire smoke, you know, we already had kind of a glimpse of what our fire season is going to look like. We have a uh, respite right now. We have kind of a period where we're able to recover from that, but it's, it's on its way, uh, and so making sure that we're prepared for it because it does cause all kinds of complications, especially chronically year after year, uh, for those who are ill and those who aren't. And so this chart looks at the effect of fine particulate matter. We call that PM 2.5. We'll go through that a little bit more in detail in our later talk. Um, but wildfire smoke is primarily composed of that PM 2.5. And it's really important because at that small scale, those particles are able to pass through the lung blood barrier. What that means is as you're breathing it in, it's going into your blood. So this is important because things that are being absorbed into your blood thicken your blood and make it work slower and make it less able to pull oxygen from your lungs as well. Uh, and so again, like with heat, we see wildfire smoke causing complications because it makes your body work harder overall. And so this is a chart that looks at different categories of people and their effects from wildfire smoke uh, at different lag periods after exposure. So uh, down on the bottom of each of these little charts, we have lag and then there's a number, zero, one, two, three. Um, that just means zero is same day of exposure, one is one day after exposure, two is two days after exposure, et cetera. Um, and these different categories, SES is socioeconomic status. And so all that means is people who make lots of money, people who are kind of in that middle bracket, and then people who are considered low income. Uh, and there are different exposures, as well as for men and women. And so we see that for wildfire exposure, the odds of cardiac arrest and hospitalization during and after wildfire smoke exposure increase. And they increase differently for different people, actually. Uh, and so we see that risk in women is highest with heavy smoke exposure on the same day, whereas it's highest in men two days after smoking. So that's really interesting for knowing how to work with women's health and men's health, because women are more susceptible on the same day of smoke exposure for cardiac illness. But men, you got to watch a couple days after because um, just physiologically, it works its way different. So we also see there's a higher risk women and younger ages, potentially because of a lower awareness of their risk, causing them to continue activities involving exertion and exposure during wildfire. There's a lot of messaging around men's health. There's a lot of messaging around children and the elderly. But what we're what we are seeing through this data is that because we are not messaging to everyone necessarily, those who feel like they're not as susceptible are actually going out and they're jogging and they're working and they're like, the smoke doesn't bother me, but it actually really does. And so, you know, I, I've observed this during some of our smoke events ourselves. Uh, I, you know, moderate smoke events. I've seen young guys out running. I'm like, why are you doing that? Why are you out endangering your health for like one day of physical exercise? Wait for it, Pat, wait for it to pass, maybe do some yoga, you know? Um, and so overall, we see that smoke cardiac risk from smoke exposure is highest 
Uh, on the second day of exposure, where 70% of people have the greatest risk. Uh, that two days after. And so this is really important for knowing how to work with our community, because if we have a heavy smoke exposure event, we know that it's not just the day of that's really important. It's the days following as well, especially that two day time period. And so that's going to be really important for our yellow hop folks to make sure that they're following up with people if they need to at that time period. Uh, we also have other evidence that um, Respiratory mortality is really impacted, obviously, by smoke. And so we see a 9% increase in the odds of same day respiratory death. Uh, and so that's if you have asthma um, day of, there's a 9% increase in chance that you will have to go to the hospital. Or that. Uh, and then there's a 14% increase for folks who have COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary. Uh, and so those are folks that you're going to want to make sure to watch on the day of, as well as the days after. Uh, and then cancer is also an aspect of wildfire smoke exposure. One other study that we have included in this is that people living within a 50 kilometer radius of wildfire over the past 10 years, so exposed over periods of time at, you know, kind of a distance, but still right there, 10% uh, higher incidences of brain tumors and almost 5% higher incidences of lung cancer as a result of that. So, you know, I wouldn't have gone through and said, no causes brain cancer, but here we are with this information. Uh, and so we know that the number of people that will be exposed to wildfire smoke is gonna increase dramatically over the next several, over the next decade and beyond. Um, we're even seeing that like the East Coast is now being told to make plans for smoke exposure, when that's not something that's necessarily part of their ecosystem. We here in the West are, I'll begrudgingly use the word lucky, because smoke and fire is definitely part of our ecosystem. Like these landscapes have burned since time immemorial. Tribal people have kept the land in good shape by using prescribed burns, cultural burning, to maintain the land. And so smoke is absolutely part of our landscape. But for the, a lot of East Coast communities, it really isn't. And so now they're being exposed to all the smoke coming down from California, and they're radically unprepared. Uh, and so pat ourselves on the back here a little bit for having dealt with these things for so long. And this is really implications for our wildfire fighters because they're chronically exposed to smoke. Like this is a prescribed burn. This isn't even a suppression fire, but we're seeing that this, this person is literally just breathing in this smoke right now. Uh, and so this is really important because we need people to fight fires, but we're asking folks to endanger their health to be able to keep us safe. So this is something that we're going to have to deal with in a longer term way, knowing that we need to be fighting fires as well. Um, we also uh, see a higher potential for a biological contamination, specifically harmful algal blooms. Um, harmful algal, like, not all algae causes harmful algal blooms, but some do. Uh, and so this figure here, figure 3D.3, is for uh, the Puget Sound specifically, just because we don't have good estimates of what this is going to look like in our freshwater. It's extremely hard to model algal blooms in freshwater because the surrounding land use is a huge factor in what's going on in the waterway. And so we have this uh, proxy estimate from a saltwater condition here in our area. Uh, and this looks at the window of opportunity for this particular uh, toxic algae to bloom uh, and how that changes over time with increasing heat. And so uh, this certain, this species of cyanobacteria, so blue-green algae, um, it's Alexandrium pensanella. Uh, which causes paralytic shellfish poisoning, and it begins to form at 13 degrees Celsius, which is also 23.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we see that as uh, this black line here is the historic window for this, and there's 68 days in our Puget Sound. And so this, this line right here is the threshold for where that algae starts to form. We see that as two degrees, if we warm two degrees, we get almost 70 more days, four degrees, we get 130 more days, et cetera. And so the window gets bigger and bigger. And so that window is important because that is um, places where that shellfish is toxic. 
right, is accumulating in the shellfish. And so um, we, you know, around the country buy our shellfish from the Puget Sound, you know, Pacific, uh, Pacific Northwest is famous for seafood. And so this is important for a human health aspect, but then also for an economic aspect. You cannot sh sell toxic shellfish, you know? Um, and so really we see the potential for biological contamination to increase just because heat is increasing. Uh, and so we have a photo from our lovely river with all of this great algae. This is not harmful algae, but it is just an example of how algae really accumulates in our river system. Uh, and so uh, again, this is a proxy estimate and it really is affected by the surrounding land use in the area. Uh, and so one thing that I wanted to know is algal blooms, both toxic and non-toxic, occur from over enriching of waterways with agricultural chemicals like nitrogen. And so this is happening because these are being sprayed across the land for big monocrops, trying to get as much in there as we can. Uh, nitrogen is extremely water mobile, so it moves with the water. So when we get those heavy rain events, it will wash off of the farm fields and into the river. The nitrogen itself is not necessarily an issue other than nitrification, but what happens for algae blooms is the phosphorus is also being added. Phosphorus is not water mobile, but it's soil, it's bound to the soil. So phosphorus is held by the soil. And so again, when we get those heavy rain events, the soil is eroding into the water. And so when we get the nitrogen coming off and the phosphorus coming off, boom, there's an algae bloom. And it's made worse with heat. And so really we can work with our surrounding farms to make sure that we are not over enriching with nitrogen or phosphorus to try and get a handle on these algal blooms. And so really the heat is an issue, but we also have mechanisms in place when can um, improve those to make sure that we are uh, addressing the problem more proactively. You're welcome to jump in if you want. Yeah, no, that's awesome information. It makes total sense. Yeah, I mean, so much of the climate impacts are just very tangled with land use. And yeah. kind of what we've tried to address here is like, yeah, this is a climate issue, but it's also this like existing and historical problem that we have the mechanism to change. Yeah. So it's good news and bad news. Yeah, this is awesome, amazing. So farming shellfish, I mean, we have to clean up some stuff. Yep. Yeah. So this fourth impact that we're going to talk about is complications from other things that are not just harmful algorithms. So we're talking about mold, infectious disease, foodborne illness, and insect vector illness. And so uh, consuming contaminated plants and animals and breeding harmful products and drinking contaminated drinking water are the modes of infection through these specific ones that we're going to talk about. In a figure 3D.4a on page 146 goes through a, a really rough projection of how some of these will change for a lot of the agricultural systems here in our area. Uh, our seeded lands are very heavily agricultural uh, and so this is pretty relevant for the way that our area might experience impact. Uh, and so we see all, there's a lot on this diagram. It takes a little bit to sit and look at, um, but the white lettering is going to be those pathways of contamination. The size of the arrows shows how likely that is to grow. Uh, and then the red lettering is kind of that um, mode of uh, transportation. And so we see here volatilization. What that means basically is stuff that's sprayed onto this aerosolizes like it's hot it's hot it's too hot past the point where it should have been applied there is a level that farmers are, are not supposed to apply pesticides to the field because it will it will like, become airborne uh, and people will breathe that in the surrounding air um, we see plant uptake so this is where uh like uh pesticides or herbicides might be used in the area and plants are taking them up it's a relatively small increase we see uh, matrix flow means that it's the contaminant is going into the groundwater. And so this one is uh, a problem for our area because we already have 
a nitrification issue in our lower basin that's from the accumulation of oxidation. So this is the potential for that only gets greater. Uh, dust transport uh, is exactly what it sounds like. We all know what the dust looks like in the farms out here. You see the tractors going by and it's kicking up all that dust. Um, there are actually contaminants that hitch a ride on that dust. And we'll talk about one of those specifically here in a little bit, uh, that as you're breathing it in, you are becoming potentially impacted through your lungs. I'm sorry for all the scariness of these talks. <laughs> <laughs> trying to get ahead of it. This is just like info. <laughs> yeah, this is like the worst case vision. Uh, spray drift uh, is exactly like that. The pesticides, then they drift off uh, into your house or your face. Uh, drain flow is just directly into the waterway, as well as runoff and flooding, and then vector transmission is like your car tires are moving things around. And so the largest increases are expected in particle and particle associated contaminants in dust. So like I said, the dust transport. Um, runoff is going to be another big mode of transportation of contaminants for us, and then particle vector transmission. So some, if, if you're having a hard time of Envisioning what some of these mean, there's a real long, fun list here. So one of these vector transmission ones is myotoxins in grains. So a myotoxin is a mushroom that creates uh, toxicity as it's seeding, sitting and eating grain. So if you harvest your grain too early and it's still a little bit wet, and you put it into storage without any kind of like fungicide, it can cr actually create toxins and one of the most famous toxins is ergot which is partially responsible for the Salem witch trials uh, back in the day where it causes mass hysteria so if you're if you have a, a rye or a wheat that's contaminated with ergot and people are eating that and a lot of people are eating that that's what causes mass hysteria and that's actually one of the main um, reasons that the Salem witch trials happened was that ergot <laughs> I think I remember seeing something like that. Yeah. They were getting really ill. Yeah. yeah and they were blaming people. Yeah, exactly. And they're just like, I can't think clearly because we got mushroom brain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, high temperatures facilitate the introduction of new pathogens in livestock because you're having to kind of concentrate them inside based on heavy rain or extreme heat. Uh, and so your livestock are in more confined areas. And so we know that zoonotic disease in close quarters in probably not very sanitary conditions. And then human beings are interacting with them as well. And so that's where we see that zoonotic potential increase. It's where our human beings are confined to livestock not being heavily disease. All right. Um, so we're going to go on to the dust because this one's more important for our area specifically. Uh, dust is released during soil tilling and crop harvesting can carry particle associated contaminants. And one that's particularly relevant for our area is called valley fever. And it's created by uh, postidiodes, species of fungal spores. Um, and then figure 3D.4B on 147 shows kind of the distribution, the projected distribution by the end of century under an extreme, uh, extreme projection. So that's like worst case scenario at the end of the century. Um, the map is a little bit ugly. I don't really know why they've done it this way, but uh, the pink shows uh, temperature that's good for this kind of species. Blue shows the level of moisture that's good for these species. Then all of that purple is like those conditions combined. And so the purple is going to be where the greatest potential for valley fever is. And so I don't know about you, but I see a lot of purple over here. Uh, and actually, we already have valley fever uh, present in some of our soils. So in 2010, uh, valley fever was found to be endemic in three counties in Washington State, Benton County, Franklin County, and Walla Walla County were all identified as having this species in their soil. And they went through an outbreak of uh, this, this valley fever fungus in 2010 and 2011. And then they had to go on this widespread soil sterilization effort during that time. So I didn't hear about that. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. 
Uh, but it's relevant because this incidences of this valley fever are going to increase as temperatures increase and as heavy precipitation. This is really important. I first learned about valley fever from a nurse who works for the Gila River Indian community down in Arizona. And valley fever is a problem down there. And what it is, is you're breathing in. So it, it's a fungus. The fungus has spores. That's how it reproduces. These spores are attached to soil particles. The soil particles become airborne. People breathe that in. And so you're breathing in the fungal spores, and that results in a respiratory infection. And so respiratory infections, as we know, you can largely get over, but for about 1% of people affected by valley fever, they actually, it causes a meningitis in their brain. It goes to their brain and creates a brain infection. Where the, the solution to this brain infection is to have a port drilled into your skull that you have to go and get medication injected in every six months for the rest of your life. That's 1%. About 1% of the people that are affected by valley fever have that condition, that meningitis condition. That sounds horrible, and I'd like to avoid it if I can. I want to know about you guys. So this is just one pathogen that is associated with soil. Uh, and the uh, it, risk of it is projected to increase by 113% across the nation. Uh, another issue that we're expecting to see is mold because of our flooding event. So mold is one of the really insidious things to worry about because houses that are touched but not necessarily damaged by floodwaters are the at the greatest risk. So we see a house like this where we can see that the water came up, you know, kind of to this level. It didn't necessarily inundate this house. It didn't necessarily destroy anything. But because it soaked parts of the house that aren't supposed to be soaked, if you don't dry that out well enough, that has a really high potential to create some really nasty mold that if you are in your house all the time, you're breathing that in. Uh, and so when we have flooding events, we need to make sure that we're not just looking at the houses that are physically damaged. But we are looking at also houses that might have been mildly damaged and making sure that those are having mold inspections and mold remediation by trained professionals wherever possible. Um, because 21% uh, of current asthma cases and an estimated 8 to 10% of respiratory infections and bronchitis are associated to dampness and mold. So this is, it, you know, asthma is a lifelong issue. Bronchitis tends to come and go and flare a lot of times. So again, if we can be preventing exposure from folks to these, we're going to be preventing health problems down the line. So. Impact five, we're looking at pollen and allergies, yay. Oh. Um, while no one is going to die from having terrible allergies, it is a quality of life issue. Uh, you know, I know all of us probably have allergies. All of us probably have coworkers or family members who are just like, ah, I can't really concentrate because I've got such terrible allergies, you know? Uh, and so that over a lifetime adds up. It really um, can have kind of an impact on like, your happiness and your well being overall. And unfortunately, uh, because of increasing carbon dioxide in the environment as a result of climate change, we will see plants putting on more pollen. And it happens in three different ways. And so, chart 3D.5 shows us the three ways that that happens. So, this comes from a really old study, but it's still really relevant. Uh, and so, ragweed, ambrosia, artemisifolia. Uh, about 70% of the U.S. general population has a noticeable allergen relationship with ragweed. That's quite a bit of people. Uh, I know that I have ragweed allergy. Uh, and so we can use this as kind of a proxy estimate for how, how all of these other allergens are changing. And so in 3D.5 on page 149, uh, we see three different graphs with three different timestamps. So the white bars on the left here are historic conditions. So that's like pre 1980 or pre 1880s. Um, this gray scale bar here in the middle is kind of mid century for us. 
uh, well, it's 2000, so it's like past at this point. Um, but the black bar is going to be our mid century, our 2050 estimate for these things. So on the top, we see in, in grams per plant. So that is like the poundage of pollen that each plant produces. The second one is pollen spikes. So that's the number of um, spikes that a plant puts out, which is going to increase as a result of carbon dioxide. Like we can see that all of these are increasing. And then the last one is our floral spikes. So that's uh, the number of flowers on the plant that then produce. Uh, and so we see a 20, 222% increase in ragweed pollen production is estimated for 2050. And so that's a, an effect of all of these because each plant will be producing more flowers, which is this middle one, that is producing more pollen. And then there's actually evidence that the pollen's antigen, which is uh, colloquially named antigen E, actually will increase in uh, its intensity as well. So it uh, has 100%, 180% increase by mid-century uh, in its ability to elicit a histamine response. So yeah, this is the allergies are increasing in a number of different ways in the function of the plant. So it's not just more plants and it's a longer growing season as well. So there's a lot of different factors that lead to greater allergy. We're actually really seeing this already in the community. Um, so I was out tabling for last year's community picnic and I was having people kind of do their the drawing board and kind of share things that they're experiencing. And so we had so many people say, oh my gosh, my allergies are so much worse now. Uh, and so we are actually experiencing that and our community is actually noting that as something that they are experiencing right now from the effects of climate. And so um, an inventory of other high allergen producing plants could be conducted. Like this is just one for ragweed that we know of. Um, it would be interesting to know what other people are allergic to and how that might change with increasing carbon dioxide in the air. Uh, and precipitation affects dust in the spring, uh, but airborne particles are mostly affected by vegetation in the summer. And so we see for dust, there's some good news that um, because of the increasing vegetation in the spring, it might actually hold some of that dust down. Uh, doesn't really work so much if our farmers are still really tilling to get rid of that vegetation. So it's not exactly a one to one, but it's good to know that that vegetation growth might actually have some suppressing effect in some of these airborne. So to RC, I know that you've seen a little bit of this here. So uncertainty around ozone effects. Ozone is a air pollutant that is made up of three oxygen molecules uh, that is produced by a variety of different industries. Our cars, power plants, refineries uh, emit the precursors, and then that reacts with the presence of sunlight and heat. So ozone is a, is a function of having specific industries located in an area, but then also experiencing extreme heat on top of that. Uh, and so in the Pacific Northwest, we actually aren't expected to experience a lot of ozone increases compared to the rest of the country, but we do see spots here. And so I apologize for kind of the graininess of this map. Uh, it was as good a resolution as you get it. We see here, here's our Washington, Oregon border, and here's Idaho right here. So here, zone six, our fishing zone six along the Columbia River is that red color. That really is affected by increasing temperature. And so we see the color scale thing um, disappear. Blue is expected to see decreases in ozone, while these red colors are expected to see some increases. Uh, and so we see quite a few, uh, quite a dark redness there in our zone six fishing. So that's going to affect our tribal fishermen who are exposed to that. Um, oh, would you say Arlington landfill has? Uh, is affects that area? Yeah, it's likely because of the industries located along there. So we have the landfill, there's the incinerator out there, the Port of Morrow is quite a polluter. Uh, and so that is a lot of, they're emitting that precursor with the heat effect. And because it's confined in kind of a gorge area, it's creating this concentration. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, and so we see the Columbia River Gorge uh, is likely to experience a 70 to 120% increase in ozone related mortality. Uh, and the Blue Mountains is expected to see a lot less. So again, out towards the east area, um, one to 2% increase in ozone mortality. We really are looking at just that zone six area for ozone, but it's important because it's very different than what the rest of the Pacific Northwest is going to be experiencing. This is uniquely our impact. Uh, and so we don't have necessarily a good handle on ozone, uh, but ozone does increase emergency department visits, hospital admissions, acute respiratory symptoms, and actually has an effect on lost days of school. Uh, and so on the next page, there's a chart that looks at national impact. So this is again across the United States. This isn't for our region specifically. But we see things like missed days of school increase. Uh, black, uh, gray is uh, 2035, orange is 2030. Uh, and so we see respiratory symptoms, missed days of school, emergency department visits, hospital admissions all increase because of ozone. And again, this across the United States, so this isn't necessarily super, super accurate for us. But again, knowing that zone six is going to be affected is really And so this is because it's the Columbia River is zone six very locally. We can have an impact by talking with the industries that are located along there and making sure they have good ozone scrubbers. Uh, but then also it's a global issue because a lot of our air, we share an air shed with the Pacific Rim. And so we get a lot of Asia's air uh, that comes over in the summertime. And so we've actually seen a 30% increase in ozone concentrations come across the uh, United States West Coast. And so we can be addressing the issue locally as well as engaging globally with our partners across the ocean. Thank you. 30%. Good luck, kids. Yeah. <laughs> I promise it's all bad news. But here's some of the good news is I have to get at some of these. Um, I want to, I know that it's a lot of doom and gloom when we talk about climate change issues, but I do think that there's a lot of joy and hope to be had because the society that we're trying to create to deal with climate issues is a good society in general. You know, we should be striving for it anyway. Uh, and so really this just makes the creation of that society all the more urgent, all the more important. And so we can do that by um, inspiring and uh, supporting our K-12 blended science, technology, engineering, and math, our STEM, with culture. So there are a number of people who are doing this already, and this is an opportunity to really uh, shout out folks who are doing that. And so, um, you know, our after school program has done some really great things with uh, inspiring uh, Knowledge Keeper Linda Sampson has been doing some really great things with her after school program. Uh, Althea Husey's Wolf, when she was working for our Nick Galley Community School, created the First Foods Academy. And then the Tamaicht, the language programs, Earth Oven, uh, revival of language as well as practice were all really amazing parts of examples to point to for blending STEM culture together. And so we have examples to look to, then how can we uplift and expand some of those things? That means developing additional curriculums uh, that use culture and first foods to teach science, as well as uh, inspiring and facilitating training, scholarships, and internships for youth and decision makers. So youth gets a lot of attention when we talk about training and internships, but there's also a place for uh, decision makers of families, decision makers of committees and commissions, decision makers of tribal governments, to also go through some of these internships and learn a little bit more hands-on uh, for some of these um, issues that we're experiencing. And of course, paying people to learn is a huge part of building the world that we're trying to create. Um, providing routine trainings about climate impact. So that's what we're doing here today. Thank you for being part of it. Uh, for tribal community, as well as committees and commissions. Um, supporting scholarships for tribal members to pursue natural resources medical science, as well as public health and policy. There are quite a few scholarships based on kind of the social media that I'm seeing. Lots of scholarships for tribal members to go into healthcare fields. It would be amazing if we could have a similar level of effort for things like natural resources and policy. So we're making sure that tribal members are represented in every discipline, have a broad interdisciplinary understanding. 
always we need to be identifying needs and gaps. Uh, and so there's quite a few ways that we are already doing this and some ways that we could be supporting this uh, in a little bit more consorted way. Um, feedback and suggestions from tribal members who are employed. So this is important because it's a very unique perspective. Not only are you tribal members, you have the understanding of the culture and the land, but also as an employee, you see kind of the inside workings of our institutions. And so tribal members who are employees have a very unique perspective and a really interesting and useful view of things. And so making sure that we are having mechanisms to listen to these folks, especially, um, as well as developing both formal and informal channels of feedback. We have a lot of formal channels. You know, we go through our assessments regularly. Uh, we have evaluations of projects and programs. Um, but there are a lot of informal ways that we could provide places for folks to give feedback regular gathering groups like the Weavers group, uh, culture night, uh, excursions, all are wonderful ways of encouraging folks to share what's on their mind, but not have to like sit down and write out a form. And so um, making sure that we're having those mechanisms. Uh, building capacity to engage with legislative opportunities. Um, I know that our legislative affairs office is inundated pretty chronically with um, different uh, bills and legislative actions that are going through. Like, what does the tribe think about this? And where's the tribe's perspective on this? Um, I think we can be really quickly overwhelmed. I know that uh, in my, what I was being asked to do, I was being very quickly overwhelmed. Uh, and so really building our, our uh, staff and institutional capacity to engage with legislature, particularly our Office of Legal Counsel, uh, around health. I know Brent Leonard has been involved with the Yellow Hawk Tribal Health Center, making sure that folks there are getting engaged with um, legislative and rulemaking. And so that's something that we could support and expand with additional funding. Uh, as well as health commission ability to engage with agencies. So this is again something that's already kind of being done. We have a number of health commission uh, members who are on state and federal boards for health. Uh, and so this is an excellent start. We need to be figuring out how we can expand it because one voice is wonderful, many voices are even more powerful. Uh, another way to expand capacity is credited continuing education. This is called CCE for health professionals and other lawyers and things who need to have certain levels of continuing education every year to certify. Uh, and then community education. And so that's just like providing education for families uh, and making it fun. So um, one way that we could do uh, kind of an educational push for the community is by mapping out tribal specific indigenous understanding of health. One, one thing that I've been really obsessed with, really love the way that they've done, is the Swinomish Nation has their indigenous health they spent many years sitting down with their community, asking their community, what does health mean to you? And we have um, the results of that in the later health and happiness part of it. And so I'll go through it a little bit more in detail. But we could do that for our community. Sit down with our community and say, what does health mean to you? Is it just your physical being? Is it your connection to your family? What goes into making a person healthy from a tribal perspective? Um, we could build community knowledge and empowerment around identification, wellness, and prevention. Again, we're all really, really doing this to a certain extent. Um, part of the goal of the climate adaptation plan was to bring together the things that we are already doing to make sure that people are receiving credit for the excellent work that they've been doing for all this time. So our Yellow Hawk has been doing a lot of identification of wellness and prevention and should get some good credit. Um, Develop dedicated climate adaptation capacity. And so organize regular committee, community engagement events like discussion groups, talking circles, webinars, to discuss ongoing climate impacts. So again, something like this. So just making sure that people have an opportunity to come and say, this is what I am experiencing, or these are the barriers that I have, or these are something great that I got or have. You know, Darcy, I think that you're a really great example of that. Like, you're doing all these cool things and you're just doing them. And so the opportunity to have you share the things that you're doing is a lot of why we're continuing to have these things, even though they're like 
you know, everybody's not doing things right now. Yeah. So, um, no, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to learn from what you're doing, and I think it's really valuable. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. In the long term, we could just build capacity to organize and implement projects. And so that really just means a lot of staff. Uh, and then provide a, yeah, <laughs> a few little new things. Uh, provide liaison for project implementation between tribal government and community. Um, I think that the position that was flown in the executive director office, the climate coordinator, uh, is a really good example of that, of this liaison liaison position where you can kind of sit over the top and say, oh, these people are doing this thing. These people are doing this thing. What if we kind of put this together and strengthen it and try to get Second goal is approach public health holistically with cultural connections. Jan Yellowhawk is really doing this. Um, one thing that we could do the more intentional about it is begin tracking tribally unique harm exposure pathways. That's a lot of words for saying that tribal people exist differently than kind of what the other people that planning is usually doing. Um, and so because tribal members are out of the land so much, because tribal members engage with the plants and the water in a much closer connection to them. Like folk in town, let's be honest, um, tribal people are exposed in different ways and a little bit more uh, level of exposure than people who aren't doing those things. So again, mapping out things like um, wet house is a really good example of it. Um, you are taking water from the river, putting it on the rocks and breathing in the steam. And so whatever is in the water, not only are you drinking it, but you're also breathing it in wet house way. And so that sweat house practice is unique because people who don't sweat are not breathing in the water. And so they're not experiencing that exposure pathway the tribal people are. And so just making sure that we're mapping out those exposure pathways that are unique to tribal ways of life and unique to culture can help us get a handle on what's happening with everything. Identifying gaps, always important. You could look at expanding capacity of our laboratories. We have two laboratories with our tribal government. Um, EESP runs kind of a contaminant laboratory. And they were recently granted a toxicology grant, something like a million dollar toxicology grant, um, to start getting a handle on PFAS. I don't have the abbreviation for that, um, but it's the forever chemicals that we're hearing about in the news now. And so they just received a toxicology grant to hire a couple people to start testing things for those PFAS. And so that's one example. Uh, and then Yellowhawk also has a laboratory that's a little bit more geared with infectious disease. Uh, but could also be geared up to um, be a little bit more responsive to climate impact. What about the wet laboratory? Yeah, um, that's a good one. I I suspect that they're a little bit more focused on rearing the salmon or the lamprey and the freshwater mussels, but that would also be a good place to get a hold of a uh, handle on what fish specific pathogens. Is that just something that we're seeing? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, talking to tribal members just kind of um, here and there, there is a lot of concern about the fish. There are a lot of people who say that they don't eat the fish for contamination reasons, and that breaks my heart to hear. Uh, and so getting a sense of what are the safety concerns and what are the realities around our tribal fish. Um, that's absolutely yeah, I won't eat sturgeon, you know. Oh, yeah, for a good reason. That is why I'm accumulating, yeah. Very smart and, and, and the heartbreaking at the same time, too, you know. Uh, looking at. Uh, here we go, climate impacts that compound over a lifetime. So this is, again, tracking more of these pathways. Um, poor health doesn't come from just one event. Poor health comes from a lifetime of experiencing exposure to different things. So making sure that. We are understanding the climate potentials for all of the different factors that go into health, like indoor and outdoor air quality, preventing mold, reducing heat, uh, having access to transportation, controlling contaminants on the land, mitigating for social isolation. All of these things have an effect. Climate change has an effect on them. All of them have an effect on our health and well being. Just making sure that we're understanding that climate change is not this singular event outside of 
relevance to us. It is happening to us right now and it has a daily impact on us. So um, then ensure access to air purification and personal protective equipment. So I have all of my lovely examples up here of many of these things. Uh, and so again, um, I'll go through it a little bit with our uh, air quality talk, but we actually had the opportunity to just give uh, air filtration equipment to the community. And so that was really educational. We're kind of trickling, we're hearing information trickle back to us from that. Uh, and so doing that again, making sure people have access to the things that they need. A lot of this is really expensive uh, and needs regular filters changed over time. And so it can add up. And so just making sure that people have the space in their budget to have personal protective equipment really, really helps. Um, Encourage frameworks that allow for well-being and connection. That's again just more of that supporting some of that stuff that we're already doing. Uh, shout out to our cultural resources protection program for their first heard excursions. Uh, Department of Child and Family Safety for being part of that, uh, and for all of the family engagement things that have been um, organized and planned are all really great opportunities with this. Um, another way that we can do this, approach things holistically with culture at the center, is making sure that we are centering elders, two-spirit, disabled, and other marginalized identities in emergency planning. And again, this is important because these are folks that are going to be experiencing unique uh, exposures or unique things to arms. Uh, and so it's again, that curb cut theory is word for it. If we are planning for the people who are most marginalized, we are planning for everyone. Uh, and so to do that, we would want to actively seek opinions and perspectives of those voices, not all of them. We know who the really engaged people are in our community. Um, we know that they have a really strong voice and their contribution is extremely welcome and really appreciated. But I think a lot of these things, we also need to look around and see who's not in the who is missing from that conversation and try to actively engage them as part of it. Um, conduct air quality sampling and monitoring with marginalized people. This is something that would be a really interesting student project, I think, uh, of working with folks, elderly folks, um, unsheltered folks, people who work outside, um, and have them kind of direct the study. Like, ask them what are they experiencing, what are they worried about, and then maybe set a purple air monitor wait where those people are working so that we can get a sense of exactly what those people are experiencing um, and make sure they feel empowered as part of that study. Uh, collaborate with the warming station and other regional uh, homeless shelters to identify how unsheltered community members specifically are affected. This is again, um, you know, if you don't have a house, it's pretty hard to get away from the air quality and the heat. Uh, and so we know that these folks are experiencing uh, unique exposure pathways. You no longer have a warming shelter. Yep, this is already out of date. <laughs> <laughs> But we do have neighbor to neighbor in Pendleton, so that gets captured under that regional. Yeah, things move quickly. So. <laughs> uh, prioritize the needs of marginalized people. That one already. Um, goal C would be expand organizational capacity on health needs. Uh, and this could look like developing community science reporting tools, education, and protocol. So community science is the the sometimes called citizen science, but I, that feels very like chaotic to me. Um, and so community science is uh, where we, we know people are going out and seeing the water, they're seeing the first foods, they're engaging with the land and the air and giving them an opportunity to say, hey, this is the thing that I saw. Is this pretty standard or what, what's going on here? Uh, and so there are a number of existing platforms for kind of different regions. But we could look at developing one within our tribal member core on our website where people can go and submit and say, the huckleberries have these weird burn marks on them. This is what I'm seeing. On them. Or the sturgeon, you know, have this like bluish tinge as I'm pulling it out of the river, you know? Like just what are people? Well, yeah, because I was talking to you. It's light. My sturgeon. Yeah, and she was saying that there, she got a fish in the distributions and she opened it up and it was like green and slimy on the Oh, side. wow. She's like, I just put it in the garbage. I was like, our fisheries guys would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. So, yeah, getting that word out. Exactly. Those kinds of things. 
of like what are people experiencing and having a place for people to share that. Yeah, we've heard about that, but I've never seen one. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Dina has. Dina. Yeah, um, how it works. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Um, and so then uh, long term facilitating training on the reporting protocols. Uh, if we wanted to make this into something that is legally defensible, we could have, um, you know, their sampling protocols are part of how we make data defensible. Uh, and so community science is a little bit not legally defensible because not everybody is trained in the ways of collecting it. It's kind of anecdotal. Uh, but if we were to have uh, training on the protocol, we could actually generate legal. Like composting or something? That being observation, like over time. Yeah, so if you were testing your compost for like, water holding retention, there are different ways of doing it. So if you were to kind of standardize that testing process and say, this is what I put into the compost, this is its water holding capacity, this is the nutrients that it tested at. And then just kind of do that over a period of time so that you have this body of data mm -hmm. that is legally defensible. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, develop climate change specific internships with Yellow Hawk. A little bit of a repeat of the other one, but this one's for Yellow Hawk specifically, uh, with the aim of expanding connection and coordination between the tribal government and the tribal health center. Um, you know, we do kind of exist under one entity, but in practice, that can fall apart a little bit if we don't have kind of this placed framework for that collaboration. Uh, and then uh, support internships. The public health and research partners. Um, Sadal Harrison is a great example at Oregon State University School of Public Health. She's been facilitating a lot of uh, TIR students and uh, tribal youth to get hooked up with that program. Uh, and so continuing that kind of collaboration. Um, and then actively incorporating climate change impact into health assessment services evaluation project. So I know that we just went through a uh, community health Flipping through it, there are places where we could add some of these things. Well, how are your allergies doing? Uh, do you worry about mold in your home? You know, are you experiencing heat for prolonged periods of time? Um, there are ways that we can ask some of these questions now and start getting a sense of what is exactly happening in our community. We have not a lot of data. That's one thing going through this that we see is there are gaps in information. So the earlier that we can start generating some of this data and information, better off we will be able to sort of continue and improve these services for our community. So I think that that actually takes us to our 10 minute break. So, do you guys have anything you wanted to talk about or questions that came up as part of this? I know it was a lot. There were so many. I wish I had brought a piece of paper and I didn't. Um, You're welcome. I like right in that one and take it with you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I appreciate the fact that I came. Um, our emergency preparedness people need to be here. Be here. Our health people need. Our cops. Well, and we're recording it, so I know that um, I've been in communication. Yellowhawk hired an uh, emergency preparedness person, so Kila Solomon is now working with Yellowhawk as part of a grant from Oregon Health as well to do some of this, and so. Uh, we've been in communication because how long has she been here? Uh, a month, I think. Like that. Still it's kind of funny because like we had an impasse and we were not even told that, you know. Yeah. So she contacted me wanting to know the filter is down to two months. So that's that's the only reason I know that she. And so this this air monitor thing that's reading it, and it's reading really high. Why would is it? Um, it's actually really low. Oh, okay. What's yeah. the six thirty? It's carbon dioxide. Oh, oh, I see. So this measures particulate matter over here. Oh, okay. And carbon dioxide. Does that measure mold? It does not. That's a question that we get a lot of. Is it doesn't measure mold because the particles are in between that 10 and 2.5 size grid. This measures particle size 10, which is dust particles. And it measures uh, particle 2.5, which is smoke. So a small grant that maybe we could be looking at for somehow, um, and I'm just thinking of the purple air monitors, so people do get that. You know, when we had the big, big orange outside for a couple of weeks uh, inside the building, Caleb had, had put a, a purple air monitor inside, and then he showed me what it was, and you know, the screen is always always out there, and we were like, heck, it's way up there, and that was in the building, yeah. you know. 
And they ended up finally letting everybody go home and breathe their dirty air at their house. <laughs> necessarily communicate is the building that you're in has a lot of effect on whether or not you're a safe person. Um, my house is extremely dumb. It's very difficult to get my house past 200 parts per million hazardous. Even with all of my filters running at the same time, um, this building, the HVAC, I think goes in and out. Uh, Public Works does their best to try and maintain it, but it is a uh, old system and ventilation. Unfortunately, when people are building buildings. Ventilation is always something that's an asset, but it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yep, uh, which is terrible because we spend so much of our lives here breathing in the air. Uh, Your waking hours are here. Yep. So yep. Um, the one thing that I did think about because my sister lived in Walla Walla Court and you know she had really bad lung issues. I mean, I mean it's not just that. I mean, she you know there's personal stuff in there, but you know how you were talking about the buildings that maybe they didn't get flooded, but they were wet. So she lived right behind her. It was like a little pool of water that doesn't dry up until maybe now and they can actually mow it. Now that's touching the building. And they say they tested and there was no mold. And I'm like, I would see, um, like they put a new floor in and you could see a black movement going across underneath that flooring. Yep. yep. Uh, you are not the only one I've heard out of that wall wall. Uh, we got a call from my tribe had when we questioned does this test for mold I had to say no it doesn't because that's what she was really worried about there are air filters that do test for mold we don't have any of them we haven't purchased any of them so that would be a great mini grant is purchasing a bunch of those mold receptive filters to put in, in those yeah. next door there were I live in a 20 alder drive by the wetlands yeah yeah exactly and so anything that's going to be sitting in water susceptible to mold the reality really is. Yeah, and we couldn't say anything about it, but when you, we all read about that, you know, you know, because Marcus said, no, no, we tested it, no mold. And I've, I've just seen what you just put that. Yeah, the building does do a good job of trying to communicate with people about using the filtration fans, like the, you know, air really in the bathroom. Yeah, the bathroom. Um, not putting blankets and stuff up. That really isn't getting to that um, the foundation where the mold is likely to be. Moisture the issue. The moisture. Yep. So they have migrated a bunch of their uh, air filtration systems up from the basement into the attic, which is great. You still have that. that yeah, I mean, yeah. Because they don't still manage. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I, and I think that's a good idea. And um, I'm going to try to convey to Donald because he's the only staff that we as a board member, board trustees can actually ask of. But through our commissions and committees, we get access to different staff. I talked to John Barkley too, because I remember after the February 2020 flooding event, yeah. he was starting to organize like a mold training and assessment, but then COVID hit. And so then they just completely lost that thread. So there was that thought right after the flooding event that we should be doing that. But unfortunately, the pandemic. So, and the one thing that we don't have a purple air monitor anymore inside. We, I monitor it over there, um, and that's the closest, but when we had it inside, it was really nice. And I asked Caleb about it. I go, where are they at? And he goes, we deployed them somewhere else. And I, I think for the sake of Donald and his determination and or Kat and the rest of us, but uh, we need to get another purple air monitor inside here. I use that when I go to DNR and use that one. Yeah, I think finance has one. Of but I think the foyer needs one yeah. because that's where the big, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lower level. Oh, yeah. See, yeah. yeah. Oh, and there's a side, like, I think, so we, you have that one, and is that one that could be used, like, at the foyer? Yeah. yeah. Put one out there. So I, I stole this from DNR, so this is ours, but I don't know that anything's in it. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, just. No, I mean, <laughs> well, because, you know, it's got to be, and it can't be in Don's office because we're probably more protected. And when we go back into our little areas versus where this door is opening and closing and yeah, opening, especially when smoke is up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think more information is never a bad thing. And I, I want to let don't I keep on trying to let them know. Hey, and I should bring it up at one of our after one of our meetings when we sit around and you can monitor yourself for air just outside. But when we had it high up to three hundred something inside this building, I was like, oh my. God. It was really illuminating. I know that I had one in my. 
it was uh, 600 to 800 parts per million outside, and it was too that still has a inside of my house with all of my filters running. That was the lowest that I could get it. And, and that that point, we need to be pulling in our field staff. We they just need to come in and they don't have some that duty area, but so this is kind of really right now for us as we get close to it, there are, the fires are starting and they're just grass fires. It's not even up there yet, really, necessarily, except for in Canada. Maybe I don't know what, what's going on right now, but I mean, it's all of Canada's on fire. Oh. Is it partly, do you think in the northern areas, is it partly because of maybe, is there some permafrost there that's melting and the methane is really getting in? Sorry. Um, it could be. It's a lot of the fact that much of Canada, while it's forested, is plantation. All over there, too. It doesn't have the health that a forest should have. It has the burn ability of a plant. So that's a lot of what's happening. Methane is not going to be the uh, VOC. Monitor, so that's the uh, volatile organic compounds, uh, and that methane. I gotta go fast, but then I also have a work yeah. session. And what's the next one? I know I'm, I always miss these, but I know they're recorded. Yeah, uh, we're gonna spend a couple minutes on emotional health, and then we're gonna be talking about air quality and stuff. All those questions that you had. We do actually have kind of a draft threshold for staff action that we're gonna share as part of this, um, but I don't think it's made it. And, and, and while she's being nice, but she says, you know, on our on our seated area, our Aboriginal user that they're, they're doing farming practices, we personally are doing that. We are putting over a million dollars worth of inputs into our farming activity. And, you know, people who live out in the wheat fields, you know, they go and then they get the drift. And then yeah. okay. that big dust storm, think of what's in there. Like, oh my God. Well, I see houses just surrounded by after making circles. Yeah, for <laughs> when I see I, and I see orchards uh, cut down in the Yakima Valley and the people are like, hey, you should go get some of that. And they would cook with that. I go, I always think about what could be in those limbs just because it, however long that tree has been out there, they've been spraying that, that baby. Twice a year, too, probably. Probably, yeah. Uh, kind of like sometimes it, you see the apples in the, and like they're white, like towards the end, you know, before they come get ready to harvest the last spray that they're doing to keep yeah, it. It's so, wax on them. It's going to get worse because they're going to start putting more of those conditions become like heavy rain events, wash the nitrogen away, wash the pesticides off of the new. You know, they're going to just do it again. So we're going to get an increase. GRC is now on our farm committee, which is really good. And then, uh, thank you. And then, um, and we're like, but there, are, most of us are like looking at regenerative ag, you know, instead of using cover crops. So the soil doesn't blow away. So that stuff is, yeah. like you said, it's a little bit more dormant. The cover crops are actually really viable for us. A lot of the old timers will say that we don't have enough moisture to keep a cover crop and then have a regular crop. That's actually not true. They proved that out at the research station outside of here. You can cover all here and keep that moisture. We were just at Ponderay yeah, too. Yes. No, Cheney. We wouldn't be, uh, you know, Chris, Dr. Snyder, whatever, you know that guy. Yeah. He got a uh, place, a farm to allow him to do cover crops and then uh, uh, cattle. Mm -hmm. And you know he's pretty good. He knows the fencing and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. So um. So yeah. He, he showed us where he's grazing cattle on those cover crops, trying to hopefully to leave at least a third of the crop of the the plant up, so that it, it strives yeah. to live again. Yeah. A lot of things we can be doing better. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. Drink. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks. I guess we have a good meet with Bonneville Power Administration. Oh, give him hell. <laughs> Did you choose to do that? <laughs> no, I appreciate you being engaged with this. I really yeah, do. Yeah, I, the timing on these are never great, and I didn't get the advertisement. It's hard because what people like the youth are interested. But, yeah. They'd rather go on a trip, you know, and you know. love to make this more fun. That takes a couple more people than me. Yeah. Uh, that is the aim. And then, you know, this is not about us, you know. It's, it, you know, we know it's not even about them. It's about their children, grandchildren. Is that what are we leaving them? Yep. Uh, just a caustic world, and I just. Oh, it's not good. <laughs> <laughs> it could be. We can get right. there. Absolutely. And so your presence here as part of this is a step in the positive. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you trying. <laughs> It'll be all right. It'll be good. It's recorded. That's one thing. It is absolutely. And Donald, he he goes. Oh, I need to get one of these. Did he get one? 
climate adaptation plan? 